Good morning, PCC. We are so glad you're joining us today. And whether you're here in person or online, it's great to see you. If you're new to Pacific, welcome. We would love to connect with you. So please let us know in the chat where you're from, or if you're at the church, come say hi after the service. Today, John is continuing on in Matthew with our series entitled, Behold the Kingdom of Heaven. We'll hear today about how Jesus' presence means the kingdom of heaven has come near. And we are excited to see as we continue on through this series, how his presence will be manifested in our midst. If you're at the church, we're going to stand together as we sing. And I invite you to consider that as you're at home as well. As we engage our bodies in worship, we testify to our souls and to each other that God is worthy of our praise and we respond to his holiness with our whole selves. As we begin today, would you join me in our call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 99, responding with the words in bold. The Lord is King, let the nations tremble. He sits on his throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. The Lord sits in majesty in Jerusalem, exalted above all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Your name is holy. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established fairness. You have acted with justice and righteousness throughout Israel. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain in Jerusalem, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. The Lord our God is holy. Let us praise him now, lifting up his holy name as we sing.
all the lost and lonely All the thieves will come confess And know that you are holy And know that you are holy And all will see hearts who are content, all who feel unworthy, all who heard with nothing left, will know that you are holy.
soul on Jesus when the mountains shake I put my trust in soul is lost at sea he will be my rock my vision be in Christ alone this grace is all we've got his love is like the mind strong enough to carry me through it all by the grace of God. So high upon his shoulders, safely brought this far.
Amen. We are privileged to be able to praise His holy name, declaring His glory from the rooftops, from the mountaintops, to the world around us. His kingdom has come near. Now, as we come to our offering, we pray that God's will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven, and we trust Him to give us today our daily bread. Let this offering be a symbol of that trust as we give financially, which you can do at the link below, through the Pacific app, or if you're at the church by placing your offering in the basket on the table at the back. We ask God to bless these offerings and use them for His kingdom work and to bring glory to His holy name. Join us now for our prayers of the people. Let us offer our prayers together now uniting our voices with Christ who perfects our prayers. Lord, you are our good shepherd. We lack nothing. You make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside quiet waters. You refresh our souls. You guide us along the right paths for your name's sake. Even though we walk, in the dark valleys and times. We will fear no evil. For you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil. Our cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow us all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You, Lord, are our rock in our salvation. You are our great King who is above all. You created this earth and hold all things together. Nothing is uncertain for you. Together, as a body of believers, we have hope for the future. You are our light on any dark day. And the days are dark right now. There is so much that causes confusion and discord in the world. So much that causes us anxiety, fear, and deep sadness. Holy Spirit, we need your help. Thank you, Lord God, for your great love, for your word, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Some of us are so desperate for hope right now. Some of us are feeling worn down by these challenging times. Some of us feel so distant from friends and family. We turn to you and pray for comfort from your word and from your spirit. Your spirit guides each of your followers in unique work, like parenting, leading, caring, educating, protecting, serving, and counseling. Without your spirit, we would crumble, fade, and fall apart. We humbly acknowledge that we may, that we need you in all that we do. Thank you for the unique calling on each of our lives. We pray for a sense of renewal and hope as we move through the fall and into winter. Be our inspiration and guide in our callings. May we bring glory to you in all that we do. You are the light of the world, and our hope is in you. We pray that our neighbors, co-workers, friends, and family may know you as their source of hope and the light of the life. We think of them now as they come to mind. And we thank you for how you provide for our every need, for finances, for resources, for community. You are so generous with us. Help us to be generous with others. Now, O great God, bless Pastor John as he presents your word to us this morning. Help us to not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well. Anoint our eyes to see your image residing deep within each person we meet. Anoint our ears to hear the cries of all who surround us, especially the needy. Anoint our hands to do gospel work. Anoint our lips to speak gospel peace, so that in all ways, 
in all times, in all places, we may glorify you. In the name of Christ alone, we boldly pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Pacific. Uh, praying that God is blessing you as you are worshiping uh, together with your community. And we are uh, digging into the scriptures again around this theme of behold, the kingdom of heaven. And we are looking at the Gospel of Matthew, and I trust that you've been uh, able to join us as we've been carefully going through, chapter by chapter, how Matthew is revealing to us that the kingdom of heaven is in fact real. If it was a real kingdom that Matthew said was coming in Jesus Christ at that time, then we have to believe that that real kingdom is for today, too. This is something bold that Pacific, we've been united in as we are moving forward in these days in which we live in. What are we united around? We're united around this reality that we want to see the kingdom of heaven come in our time that we live in and in our place and, and here at Pacific. And I love that we are doing that. We're praying every day to see God's kingdom come. In chapter four, we looked at Jesus Christ is in fact the Messiah. And we know this because if he's the one that's bringing in the kingdom of heaven, then there are three aspects of the kingdom that will come to pass through him. The first is that he would defeat Israel's enemies, and we saw that early in chapter 4, how he defeated the devil in the wilderness. Secondly, that God would build his kingdom through the Messiah by bringing back from exile God's people. And we see that that has happened through Jesus Christ because he is calling people unto himself. And yesterday, last week, we even uh, went to the Lord to say, oh God, use us to call many unto yourself from exile to the kingdom of heaven. The third aspect that we're looking at today comes from Matthew chapter 5. So chapter 3, chapter 4, now into chapter 5 where we see the third aspect that Matthew has laid out for us. And that aspect of the kingdom of heaven is that if Jesus is the Messiah, then Yahweh would use Jesus in order to bless his people in the land in which they live in and lead them to observe and follow God's laws. Yeah, he would bless them in their land, and he would rule over them in that land, and he would lead his people to observe God's laws. Well, that's what's going on here in Matthew chapter 5. And so I hope you're excited about this. You've got some uh, continuity with you now uh, from the previous chapters of Matthew and ready to dig into what is called here in chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you've heard that phrase before, Sermon on the Mount. It might be a phrase that you're familiar with, but have wondered to yourself, what exactly is that sermon all about again? Well, Matthew is going to help us understand that this sermon fits within his kingdom announcement, the kingdom announcement through Jesus Christ. And so as we dig into the Sermon on the Mount, we are going to see that this is very much about the teachings of Jesus Christ. So fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven, teachings of Jesus Christ. You already know two things about the Sermon on the Mount that uh, may either help you reorganize and re-enter re into uh, what you know about this, or maybe you are learning some new things about the sermon already. Chapter 5, verse 1, we see that one day, as uh, Jesus saw the crowds gathering, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him because he's called them and he's brought them in from exile into his place where he is and he began to teach them, saying these things. And now from chapter 5 right through chapter 7, we have this uh, collection that Matthew has given us of this sermon of Jesus' teaching. Well, what exactly is Jesus' teaching here? First of all, I want us to think about this teaching with the reality of the kingdom of heaven coming because the Messiah will be used by God to lead his people in following the law of God. And so we can see that, first of all, the law of God, according to Jesus, is actually inside out. Well, say, what do you mean by inside out? Let me start with an illustration. A number of years ago, a friend of mine who owns a boat uh, decided he wanted to take me and uh, two of my younger boys out for the day. So we went out onto the ocean, and he went to a particular island that has quite a nice beach. 
and uh, led us off and said, enjoy the beach for a few hours. And so uh, we did. And my boys and I, we really like to play in the sand. And so we built huge sand castles and we got right in there, man. We were digging into the dirt and, and getting all that, not dirt, it's sand, putting that sand all over us. And uh, we got wrestling a little bit into the water and then into the sand as boys and their dads do. We did quite a bit of wrestling. In fact, when it came time for uh, my friend to come back from his boat in his little dinghy, to pick us up, we looked like we had been shaken baked and we were just covered from head to toe in sand. We had it in our hair, we had it in our eyes and in, in our fingernails. And, and so we, we showed up uh, looking like shaken baked uh, sand monsters. Well, my friend in his uh, dinghy was thinking about his boat and seeing us as sand monsters. And so he said to us, you're really going to have to get rid of all of that sand. Um, and so he said, you, you know, you're going to have to start getting that sand off your bodies. And we started to do this. And, and he said, you're going to have to get every bit of that sand out of your hair. And, and so I got it out of all of my hair, which, you know, didn't take very long. But I got it out of my hair, a little bit back here. And then out of our eyes, he said, you're going to have to get it out of your fingernails. In fact, and he said, in fact, I don't want to see one grain of sand, like as you started to describe this more and more, I finally said to him, I said, but I, I honestly don't know if I can live up to this. Like I'm feeling like no matter how much I try, I'm gonna end up with a grain of sand in your boat. Like this just seems like something I can't possibly accomplish. Well, maybe you can already see where I'm going with this illustration. And by the way, I was not able to get into that boat without coming to the terms that I was just not going to be able to get in there with 100% surety that I would not have a grain of sand upon my body. Well, the context for uh, this time in which Jesus lived in is that Israel has been operating very much like this sand illustration. They've been operating in a way where they've been saying, look, as long as we can get this sand off of the outside, as long as we can do what we need to in order to clean up the outside, then we belong in the boat. We belong in this journey to go to the, the big boat that's waiting for us. In fact, the Pharisees, Jesus points out, have been treating the law of God like that. Like they've been uh, coming before God and saying, look, God, I I've spent all day and I I've taken tweezers and I've spent all day and, and, and I just meant and I got this piece of this grain of sand off of my leg. But if you know your stories of Jesus confronting the Pharisees, he would have replied to say, you spent all day tweezering off this grain of sand, but your pockets, they're full of sand. Or, or maybe uh, the Pharisees might come and say, uh, you know what, we went and washed uh, all the sand off at the temple, God. And so we spent all day at the temple and we're washed, all that sand is off. And then a reply might be from Jesus, he might have said something like, you spent all day at the temple washing off the sand, but you swallowed a whole wheelbarrow full of it. And so what was going on at the time of Jesus around observing the law was really an outward focus of law keeping, but there was nothing happening on the inside. In fact, what God was saying is that the inside, what's going on in your heart, what's happening in your heart is actually something that's dead. So we see that happening here in chapter 5. When, he, when Jesus sits down with his group of people in order to teach about the laws of God, what he begins to teach about this is that the context in which he's living in is an Israel that has in fact lost its inner connection, its inner love, its inner passion for God, and in fact, the following of God's law from within, from inside, out. So you explain that a bit, John. Well, I can because how Matthew lays it out for us is beginning in chapter five, we see the Beatitudes. And we looked a little bit at that last week, how God is blessing those who come into the land, who are called from exile into the land. There's a blessing for them. And that blessing is because they followed him. There's an inside reality to this. And that inside reality is about following Jesus. Yeah? And so we see that in chapter 5, verse 11. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Not because 
of your observance of these laws, but because you're my followers, this inside reality. But the very next paragraph after the Beatitudes shows us this context of washing the outside, but the inside being something that is rotten. In fact, how Jesus illustrates it is with salt and with light. So let's look, jump back into the passage then in chapter 5 verse 13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And so what good is this uh, following of this observance of God's laws when there's nothing going on in the inside? It's like salt that's lost its saltiness. Here's the second way that Jesus illustrates it, and Matthew lays it out perfectly for us. The next uh, paragraph is, is illustrating it with light. You're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. But the reality of what Jesus was seeing was that Israel had lost its saltiness, that there was something rotten inside, and that Israel had hidden the light of Yahweh that was always intended to be shone out for the nations to see. And that light has been hidden from those that are around Israel, and this is something that God has not intended from the beginning, but that his teachings are now going to show us that is in fact his direction. His direction for us as believers and followers is that the law of God is actually followed inside out. We said, John, you know, explain this a little bit more, this inside out thing. A way of illustrating this is used by James in his book when he writes about how uh, a source is so important for water, that uh, fresh water uh, flows from a fresh source within bitter water flows from a bitter source. So the actions, that which comes out of a person, actually comes from what's going on within them, inside out. And that's what's happening here in the teachings now that Jesus begins to uh, give uh, us uh, as he is teaching from this Sermon on the Mount. So now we're starting to get some more understanding of what's going on in the sermon. He's teaching about inside out law. Well, if we're still tracking with this and we want to know more about what this inside-out law and teaching of Jesus really looks like, we can see now that, uh, that Matthew has laid out for us six examples of that. Yeah, there are six antitheses or antithesis that uh, are paragraphs or pieces of scripture that teach us about this inside-out action that Jesus is bringing to us. The first one is in verse 21. And this is a teaching about anger. It's an example of what he is, um, what he is wanting to see uh, from the followers of Jesus. He is wanting to see an inside change that is reflected into the outside actions that happen in our everyday life. Here's how Jesus does that. He says things like this, verse 21. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. That's an outside action. Don't murder somebody. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, you are, even if you are angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. That's an outside action. Call someone an idiot. Uh, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, in your heart, if you look at someone and you curse them, you're in danger of the fires of hell. And so this is very serious how God is giving us an example here through Jesus in his teachings that the outside action of murder is, is actually coming from within a source, a source that is in fact rotten. Well, that's the, the first example, but there are more that, uh, that Jesus gives us. There are six in total. So here's the next one, verse 27, teaching about adultery. Another example of this inside out. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. 
But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so, again, another example of this outside action of adultery is something that the law prohibited, forbid this. But Jesus is saying, what's going on on the inside is rotten. And that's what leads to this outside action. And so following the laws of God, obeying the commandments of God, Jesus is saying this is actually an inside-out action. Well, then there is a paragraph on divorce and the same thing about teaching on vows and even a, another teaching on revenge. And look at verse 43 now. You can see how the, the sermon is being laid out in these inside-out ways. And now in verse 43, Jesus says that you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So what's going on on the inside as you see an enemy, uh, an enemy of God, perhaps a Roman citizen that is walking around Israel at the time. Uh, Jesus is saying that what's going on in your heart, if it's hatred towards your enemy, then that's rotten. And so what has to happen is there has to be an understanding that following and obeying the commandments and teachings of God, well, Jesus is going to be the one that brings the kingdom of heaven to us. He's going to lead his people in the keeping of this law, and that law must be kept inside out. You have a question maybe that comes out of this is, well, illustrate it a little bit more. You talked about a source within, like bitter water flows, uh, flows out of you will, will be bitter water, a bitter source. Is there another way to illustrate this? Yes, another way would be uh, fruit on a tree limb. And uh, that fruit that grows, the outside fruit that grows, well, that fruit is good and it will grow if it's actually connected in to the tree. If it's a part of the branch, then the inside reality of what that fruit is connected to produces that outside beauty. That's another way to illustrate that. And I didn't come up with that on my own. That's something that comes out of the Gospels, illustrated for us in order to understand this reality of what God is teaching. Well, a question may come to your mind through this. A question like this, does only the inside matter then? Is this just a, a way of organizing our inside and then our outward actions are less important to God? That Old Testament law then is not something that really matters and we don't need to necessarily keep that. We just need to do uh, devotions every day and those inside kind of works and uh, that's the real part that, that matters. Well, that's not the case for what's going on here. And there are two reasons from this text that we can answer that and say, no, that's not what's going on. That in fact, both the inside and our outward actions, those laws of God that govern our inside, do not hate, do not lust, um, do not curse somebody within you. Those inside realities, those laws are just as important as the outward actions of our life. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't hate somebody. Don't hate your enemies. Well, we know this from the text, and we can see this in two ways. First, verse 48 of chapter 5. Look with me there. We've gone through now those, those six paragraphs. I've told, you've heard this. I tell you this inside reality. And now this sort of climaxes, all six of them climax. Stay with me in this. Don't, don't lose me in this passage. Comes to verse 48, which says, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Wow. Perfect. That sounds like the Old Testament law. In fact, it sounds like places in the Old Testament where literally Yahweh tells the people of Israel, here's how to obey my commandments and you must be perfect, just as God himself is perfect and holy. Well, just in case we think that that's only an inward reality of perfection, that really God's only interested in the inward side of that perfection, let's jump back because I skipped a paragraph here in chapter 5. You may have noticed it. You, you may have said, wait, you skipped this little paragraph here starting at verse 17. Why'd you skip that? 
Well, I'll tell you why. It's because this helps us answer that question of God caring about not just the inside, but also our outward actions are just as much part of this perfect living that God requires. Verse 17, let's get back to it, which says this, Jesus saying, don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. And I'm going to pause there because I love that phrase, accomplish their purpose. There's so much going on in that phrase about what it means for us as Christians to obey Jesus and to live this perfect life that the Father in heaven has required of us. Jesus did not come to abolish either those outward actions or the inward actions. In fact, what he's doing here in the Sermon on the Mount is that he's talking about this pillar that supports the Old Testament laws of God. The pillar that supports them is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Loving the Lord your God is that summation of the prophet's teaching and the Old Testament teaching, and it's that inward reality of what Jesus is exposing in these six paragraphs. I hope you're with me now as we're thinking about this because you may have arrived at a position now in your mind where you're thinking to yourself, did Jesus just raise the bar on holy living? Like, like, did he just take the Old Testament, which I'm pretty sure I read somewhere, or you, or you remember hearing about this, or you've learned it since you were young, the Old Testament law is like impossible to keep. Like, I can't possibly get all that sand off of me. Uh, you know, it's everywhere. And, and even when I think it, it's, it's out of there, Jesus, did he go and raise the bar and say, actually, it's what's inside that's also important to Jesus. Things like having a heart of justice, having a heart of mercy, having a heart of, of being a, of meekness. Yeah. See, did Jesus just raise the bar? Well, it's so important for us as we think about how we're going to live this out. And if Jesus is the one that's leading us in following the law, then it is so important for us to not just leave it at Jesus is teaching us a law that is inside out, but here's the second point that we can get from this passage and from this teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. The second point is that Jesus fulfills the law, accomplishes the law, as we saw in verse 17, accomplishes its purpose. So Jesus fulfills the law inside out. Jesus is, in fact, the one who accomplishes this purpose, and he does this through his life. He is, in fact, the one who is salt that has not lost its saltiness. He is, in fact, the one who is light that has not hidden it, but has shone it out for all nations to see. And Matthew is going to show us that in the later chapters when we see people from different nations coming to Jesus, and it's always talk about the kingdom of heaven because he is the one that is accomplishing its purpose. The purpose of the law was always about obeying the Father. And in obeying the Father, by being holy, Israel would in fact be salt and light to the world. And Jesus accomplishes that. He fulfills that by his perfection, by his holy living, by keeping all of the Old Testament commandments, by keeping all of this inner reality, inward and outward, Jesus is the one that accomplished that. That's why we call him Savior. That's why we call him Messiah. That's why we Christians are always on about him and are always looking to him, because we know that he is the one that accomplished its purpose. I don't want us to miss this. It's uh, something that I, I think deserves another illustration. So I'm just going to take a moment and set up something that is a bit of an object lesson for us that I hope illustrates better for us what it means to say that Jesus is the one that accomplished the law's purpose. So Jesus fulfills the law inside out. How do I illustrate this? A number of years ago, I was talking with somebody in their driveway, and uh, he said to me, John, am I going to go to hell? And I said, well, what do you think? Do you think you'll go to hell? And really, the inside question I recognized was him asking, John, is there any chance I might get to heaven? And his answer was, yeah, I think I'm going to go to hell. 
He said, because, uh, why, why, I asked. He said, well, because um, I swear too much and I drink too much. And I said, oh, yeah, the, those are the two. Uh, you know, and no, uh, I said, okay, well, why don't you bring out the stepladder? Uh, l- let's just sort of look at this ladder for a minute. And so he did, he brought out the stepladder and we sort of looked at it and I said, well, let's say that this stepladder represents uh, morality. I mean, you've just talked about behaviors, a couple of those behaviors that you think are bad behaviors, swear too much, drink too much. And if this ladder kind of represented being really, really holy and being really, really good or being really, really bad, if the rungs of this ladder represented that, I said, uh, wh- where would you put the, the worst person who, who ever lived? Uh, and I asked him, who do, who do you think that is? And he said, uh, it's my mother-in-law, he said. No, no, uh, no, he said, uh, probably what you thought of right away, Hitler. He said that. So, so we said, well, let's put him right down on this bottom rung. And so he said, yeah, that's the worst person that's ever lived. I said, well, what if this uh, rung here was like the best person who ever lived? Someone who is really righteous and did really righteous things. And uh, who jumped into your mind, I asked him. And uh, he said, me. Uh, I said, no. Uh, he said, uh, well, you know what? Uh, Mother Teresa. And so you, you might have thought of that as well as a name that kind of pops into your mind. Uh, you know, somebody who lived a really righteous life. And I said, this is perfection. This is somebody who, who would have never sinned in their whole life. Like if this is morality and that's the basement, then this would be the very top and this is holiness, perfection, never sinned in their entire life. Not one grain of sand on their whole body. And he had to admit that, yeah, probably Mother Teresa even isn't perfect or wasn't a perfect person her entire life, but pretty good. And so on the morality scale, up at the top there. And I said, okay, um, where would you put yourself in this? So he kind of thought about it and he said, well, I don't know. He said, I guess maybe here. And so he kind of put it on the second rung. He said, I think I'm kind of here in the whole behavior scale. I said, all right, where, where would you put me? And he said, well, I kind of think of you of like here, you know, you're a preacher and, and so you, you're probably here. I said, Not here, I said, Mr. You, no, no, here. Okay. All right, fine. Here. I said, well, th- if this is that morality scale and we kind of have an idea in our mind of Mother Teresa and everything like that and where you are and where I might be and this is perfection, where do you think God's cutoff is? I said, where, where do you think the cutoff is for heaven? I mean, the question you were really asking is, is there any chance I might be able to get to heaven? And so if it's about behavior, then whereabouts in this is God's cutoff? He thought about it for a sec and he said, mm, I think the cutoff is right, right about here. So he put himself under the cutoff. I said, okay, maybe maybe that's the cutoff there. It's really hard to understand, isn't it, about God and thinking about who gets into heaven when you start to think about where his cutoff might be. I said, what if I told you that the Bible actually says that for obedience to God, when it comes to following his commandments, when it comes to living the life that God requires of us, what if I told you that the cutoff is not here, I said, but what if I told you the cutoff is actually, it's actually up here, at the very top. Perfection, holy, passage we just read. Be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, when I stood up here and said it's actually up here, he kind of looked at me like this and went, well, well, what do you mean it's up there? That's that sounds impossible to me. It sounds like it's impossible. Does that mean God doesn't care about any of this? That he has no interest in how people behave? Or is it that he cares so much about it that the behavior has to be absolutely perfect? And if there's any mistake, any mistake whatsoever, then that actually cuts you off from his goal, which is to bring people into his kingdom. And so uh, we talked about that a little bit. In order for me to kind of get to this place of saying, you've mentioned Mother Teresa, you've mentioned others, myself, yourself, the worst people who have ever lived, some of their terrible behaviors. I said, what if I was to tell you that there was one person, one person who is able to live that perfect, holy, and sinless life? What if I was to tell you that somebody actually stood atop of this? You said, well, that... I mean, who would that person be? I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. In fact, it'd have to be miraculous. It'd have to be supernatural. It's impossible for humans to live like that. It's the story of the gospel. 
It's what's going on here in Matthew's gospel as he talks about the kingdom of heaven. And it's what I was able to describe as saying the life of Jesus Christ. The truth is that he was no ordinary man. He was perfectly man and perfectly God at the same time. That is a miracle. That is extraordinary. And in his perfection, his perfect life lived because he was God. His humanity was holy. His inside out was absolutely to every piece of the law, as Jesus said, perfect. The truth is that Jesus lived that perfect life, and in that very way, he fulfilled, he accomplished the purpose of the law. Well, I remember my friend looking at the top there and thinking about that, and then he said, well, so only Jesus gets in? Is that... Is that the deal then? Like only he was able to do it and everybody else is cut off. That's God's cut off. Everybody else doesn't get in. Well, the gospel story, as we know, doesn't end there with Jesus saying he's accomplished its purpose and no one else has, and that's unfortunate. Yes, I raised the bar. I made it even more important. It's actually it's also what goes on the inside that flows to the out. Well, the truth of the gospel we know is that because Jesus, in verse 17, says that he's accomplished its purpose, we know that Jesus' intention has always been to call people to his land, the second part of this kingdom of heaven reality, to lead people in observing the law by calling them unto himself. That land is, in fact, himself, calling people unto himself. And the way in which we as humanity are going to, in fact, receive the blessing of God and his accomplishment of the law through Jesus Christ is by believing in him. And so I got up onto the ladder again and I said, there is, in fact, a way for you, my friend. There is a way. The good news story has actually to do with morality. It does. Behaviors. It does. It has to do with that in the reality that Jesus Christ accomplished those purposes. And so he stood atop of this, and then I got right up there, and I'm just going to try to get up here now and wait, do not stand. All right, I won't stand on there, but, but I got right up on that ladder, and I said, this, the good news story is that Jesus stands atop here and calls you forward. Think of the Sistine Chapel painting of God reaching down with his great power and might and majesty and holiness, reaching down to humanity. Well, Jesus is in fact a much bigger picture and better picture of God and his great plan for humanity to reach down to those who say, I'm, I'm not able to be that perfection. I can't possibly not inside or out. But in fact, that is accomplished through Jesus Christ. And we are the ones who receive that as though God draws us up to this place of holiness, as though he calls us up to this place as his followers to be in what we know as the holiness of God himself. So we receive this. We receive this by believing in Jesus Christ. So the Sermon on the Mount really is an incredible way for us to learn both that God cares about what we do, but actually what he cares about is an inside-out reality, and that inside-out reality begins with believing in Jesus Christ. And when we believe in Jesus, here's the third thing that we see from this sermon and from the gospel itself is that those who follow, those who follow, are blessed inside out. Well, this brings us to the bigger picture of the new covenant, doesn't it? Believing in Jesus Christ is a new covenant reality where God accomplishes three things within us. And those three things are accomplished by believing in him, and we can't miss them today as we conclude. Here's the first. In the new covenant reality, covenant reality by believing in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. No, we can't possibly keep our behavior perfect, but we're absolutely expected to follow God's laws. Our behavior is meant to reflect God's laws, but from the inside out. And so our sins are forgiven because the reality is that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Those of us who believe in Jesus are now stood atop of this reality. In fact, we're, we're with God in his heavenly realm, as Hebrews chapter 8 
talks about. That's at the top, that heavenly realm. We're hidden in Christ, Paul tells us. And so that reality is that our sins are forgiven and they continue to be washed clean by Christ's work on the cross. Here's the second reality of the covenant. The second reality is that the Holy Spirit is within us and the Spirit of God empowers us. And so the new covenant reality is that as we are working towards living out this life of commandment, of obedience, as we're working that out, we're actually doing it from the inside out where the Holy Spirit is within us, empowering us to do this, giving us the strength to do this. This is where the Old Testament covenant fell short. It didn't have the Holy Spirit within empowering us to accomplish this. Here's the third way. Jeremiah uh, prophesied about this in chapter 31, and it is a reality of the new covenant, and it is that the law of God, inside and out, is written on our hearts and minds by God. It's written there. This is the work of God that's in our lives. And so our desire to want to be obedient, our desire to want to be holy, is not in order for us to be able to say, look, I can accomplish this on my own. I can do this and I deserve to be in the boat. Rather, that this is written on our hearts, inside and out. And it's written on our hearts by God himself. So that new creation life that has been established in us is one that motivates us to want to be holy. That's our desire. That's where it comes from. It's written into our hearts. It's like a new DNA. It's like a new instinct that comes from us being a new creation. Our desire to be holy is coming from that place of Jesus being, in fact, within us. And in believing in him, we receive that desire. So today, what are we taking away from this? Well, I think we're taking away from this a number of things this morning that I think can encourage us. The first is the implications of what's going on in this sermon for uh, humanity, for the world around us. The implications are that the teachings of Jesus Christ are teachings about being a salt and light to this world, and that those of us who are following God can in fact be that saltiness. We can in fact be that light for the world around us. Is that your desire today? Is that your desire as a follower of Jesus to be the saltiness of the earth, the light that shines out for humanity to see? God says that that happens through our behaviors, actually through our obedient living from actions of justice and mercy and peacefulness. Yeah. Those actions of turning the other cheek those actions display the glory of God and direct people to him and to his mercy. I pray that that might be your uh, desire today. The implications of the Sermon on the Mount fill you with a desire inspired today to holy living. I think many Christians today are in a strange place of saying, well, you know, sin's inevitable and so it doesn't really matter. Uh, I can't really accomplish it, so why should I try? And this is, a, this is a wrong teaching. This is a falsehood. It's licentiousness, a license to go ahead and sin. But you remember the Bible tells us that we've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? It's, that's the old life. There's a new life. And so the second thing that I think we can use to apply to our life today is because we are in this new life in Jesus and because the laws of God have been written on our heart, it's our instinct now, and because the Holy Spirit is within us, empowering us today, be inspired today that the holy life that you probably desire in there, I know there's a war within us of desiring what God wants and then also desiring what we all, we all want for ourselves, but we do have this desire for holiness from God. That is something that's real. It does come from our new creation life. It's written on your heart, so be inspired today to work towards the holiness of God from inside out, our behaviors, our actions, from inside out. I say, well, John, how do I, how do I work this? Because it sounds like you're going to tell me that just trying harder isn't the right way. The reality is that what Jesus is teaching us in this inside out Sermon on the Mount is one that begins with our abiding in Christ. And that's what I preached about during the candidating uh, time. Intimacy with God is the beginning place of that working out our salvation, 
working out the action of obedience from God. So I want to encourage you today and exhort you towards the living of the Christ life that comes first by abiding in him. That as we direct ourselves towards the source, we find that our behaviors are affected by that. We find ourselves living that out. That the more that we are in fact abiding in Christ, the more work he is doing in and through our lives. It's an extraordinary story. It's the greatest story that's ever been told. I pray that these uh, applications, these opportunities for us today are what bless you as you move forward in this week and as we think about the kingdom of heaven come in Jesus Christ. We've been talking about Jesus accomplishing the purpose of the law. And this morning as we come to the Lord's Supper, we are coming to participate in how Jesus accomplished that we're coming to participate in his death and in his resurrection. Let's take a moment to go to prayer. And while we're praying together and preparing our hearts to actually enter into what we've been talking about this morning out of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, let's in fact uh, listen to the Lord from the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 7 and a bit of chapter 8. And let these verses guide us in preparation for participating in these elements. Let's pray together. The Bible says, yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law never made anything perfect. But now we have confidence in a better hope, through which we draw near to God. And so we do this morning, draw near to you. Oh God, we draw near to you through your Son, Jesus. Participating of the Lord's Supper is a, an action for us, God, a, a behavior for us of this inner reality of our love for you. The Bible says, because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. Yes, Lord, it is about you, Jesus. This is the way in which we desire to live. You are the one that we desire to have in our heart manifesting through us in the deeds of our everyday life. There were many priests, the Bible says, under the old system. For death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is the one who is able once and forever to save. Those who come to God through him he lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. And today, dear Lord, we are so grateful for the forgiveness that you have given us, the reality that you have saved us. We really believe in that. As we participate today in this bread and in this cup, Lord, we remember that you've saved us. The Bible says that he, Jesus, is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He's been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Lord, we remember this latter illustration in this moment and think of you, Jesus, who is, who was sinless, holy, utterly blameless, unstained by sin. 
We think of you in your place of honor at the right hand of God in heaven, the majestic throne of God in heaven. There, Lord, we stand with you because you've drawn us in. We are there with you because of your wonderful act of the cross and the empty tomb. Thank you, Jesus, for fulfilling the law. Thank you, Jesus, for leading us in this new covenant way of observing the law, following the law, and keeping through you the law. And thank you, dear God, for drawing us into your place, your land, yeah, into your very presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus took bread with his disciples. He broke this and said that this is my body broken for you, his action on the cross. He also took the cup and said this cup is a cup of the new covenant, his blood poured out for us. Today, as we participate, let's be reminded today and enter into the reality of our life through Jesus Christ, inside and out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much, Jesus, for your ministry, for your life, for your love. We love you, Jesus. Pray this in your name. Amen. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me. Set free. Oh, it's free. 
Well, I pray that uh, you are blessed today from uh, these teachings from Matthew. And I want to encourage you, if you'd like to continue to mull over these uh, passages, uh, to look at the Sermon Notes video for this week. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit more time uh, looking back into those Old Testament laws and the prophecies from uh, Jeremiah and others, uh, looking forward to the New Covenant and just how that New Covenant is accomplished through Jesus. Well, now, a benediction that actually comes from this uh, passage in Hebrews, speaking of the new covenant. I pray that this is a blessing for you as you leave for this uh, week that God has for us. From Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. God bless you this week, people of God. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here as we have been doing services virtually. We hope that you feel connected to us. We hope that you feel blessed by what you've heard and being a part of the service here at Pacific Community Church. I want to invite each and every one of you to connect with us. No one needs to be alone at this time. We are all part of this community. We are in this together, and there's many ways virtually to connect with each other and feel like you're a part of our family because you are a part of our family. If you have needs in your life that you would like some prayer for, we have a team that would love to pray for you. There's a link along the bottom. We would love to pray for you. Thank you again for joining us this weekend for this service. We invite each and every one of you to join us again here next week.